We're looking at the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. And so, Lord, as we bow our heads and our hearts today, as we stand on the preface of a new year, we stand, Lord, right here on the verge. We, we finish an old year, and we look forward to a new year, and we have no idea what it's going to bring. We do pray, Lord, that you would guide our steps, that you would go before us, and that we would be faithful to follow you and see you glorified and magnified. Use us for your glory and honor, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so I do wish you a very happy New Year. I wonder how many of you celebrated New Year with me at 10 o'clock? <laughs> and then I was in bed. <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit early for some, but I guess I'm getting a little older. I like to celebrate a little early. But uh, happy New Year. Hey, as we're talking about the New Year, let me ask a question. How optimistic are you that 2023 will be a good year? How are you feeling about it? Are you feeling very optimistic? Are you thinking this is going to be a great year? Are you feeling not so optimistic about that? I mean, the last few years have been challenging, haven't they? And according to a global news interview done on the Christmas Day just a week ago, our prime minister warned that 2023 is going to be a tough year. Continue global economic upheaval. Increasing interest rates, ballooning inflation, and high costs of living. Some fear that Canada is heading into a recession. Add to this the growing presence of crime in our region. Porch pirates stealing people's gifts. Like, I can't believe that someone would do that. To gang shootings. And it's understandable why some that I talked to, and I've asked this question to a number of people, and some are, yes, very uh, looking forward to the year and thinking it will be a good year, but others are very tentative in their approach to the new year. Well, the same day that our prime minister gave his warning to Canadians, a local pastor uh, posted this on a pastor's group chat. He said, the early Christians did not say in dismay, look what the world has come to. No, but in delight, look what has come to the world. Or I would add maybe, look who has come to the world. Jesus came to be the Savior. He came to make a way for whosoever will to find forgiveness of sins and right standing with the Heavenly Father. Remember what the angel said to Joseph in the Christmas story? Joseph Son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. And it's this reminder, it's this revelation that allows us to face the coming year with a sense of surety and optimism. No matter what happens around us with the global economy or with the rising interest rates, we know that there is a God who loves us. We know that there is a God who is willing to walk beside us through the circumstances of life and help us to navigate whatever we need to navigate so that we can bring him glory and honor. And it's this understanding that we have a God that walks with us that allows us to find peace when the world is full of panic, to demonstrate wisdom and self-control when it would be so much easier just to show frustration and to offer love and forgiveness in the face of aggression and selfishness. Isaiah, the prophet, looked ahead in time, and he was very excited as he realized that the presence of the coming Messiah would impact individuals and families and entire communities. 
Isaiah wrote these words 700 years before Jesus was even born. And what he was describing here was actually hasn't even happened yet because he was describing the millennial reign of Christ as he comes back on his second coming. However, there's many similarities to the first coming, Christ's first visit as he came to be born in Bethlehem's manger about 2,000 years ago. And therefore, I think that these words from Isaiah, inspired by the Holy Spirit, will be a great source of help for us as we face the uncertainty of a new year that is before us. So what do we see from Isaiah here that might help us as we look forward? Well, the first thing we see is that the earth was full of darkness. He says, see, darkness covers the earth, and a thick darkness is over the people. Isaiah looked to a day of great darkness, into the time of the tribulation, into the time of Jacob's troubles. And you know, ever since Adam's fall, we've seen evidence of this darkness in our world. It didn't take long for jealousy and envy to take root in Cain's heart. In fact, it became so consuming that he ended up murdering his brother Abel. As you read on in Genesis, especially if you're doing the Bible reading program, You read on in Genesis, you're going to find out that soon every inclination of the thoughts of people's hearts were evil at all the time. And regrettably, we see evidence of sinful behavior down through history. And unfortunately, we are not excluded from this. It seems that whenever people ignore God, whenever people push away his ways, the clouds of despair and darkness seem to grow thicker within a society until at last we come to the place where Isaiah looks forward and the place where Isaiah predicted when a darkness will be so dense that the light will hardly be able to penetrate it. And when that happens to a heart, when that happens to a soul, that person experiences hopelessness and loneliness and despair But that's what sin does. In the chapter earlier, Isaiah says this, but your iniquities have separated you from God, from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. For your hands are stained with blood and your fingers with guilt and your lips have spoken lies and your tongue mutters wicked things. Well, that can't happen to us, could it? That could never happen in our society. That could never happen in modern-day humanity. Well, according to the University Magazine, the city of Surrey has the highest crime rate in Canada, a 17% increase in the past few years. The article noted that the good news is that the police are aware of the problem and are working hard to address it. And I'm reminded how important it is for us to pray for our police officers as we saw the tragedy in the news this week of, our, of a police officer in Ontario. And we need to pray for them because without a move of God in our land, they face an uphill battle. And that's exactly what the prince of darkness likes. And even Jesus recognized that for he says in John verse three, or chapter three, verse 19, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men have loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. And regrettably, we've all been tainted by sin in some way. And just as, well, it happens about this time of year when you go out in the morning and the morning fog kind of descends, and you can't really see past that fog. It hinders your ability to see what is ahead. The presence of sin in our lives does that too. It impacts our perceptions. It complicates everything in our lives, how we treat others, how we process the desires and temptations of our own heart. Isaiah put it this way in Isaiah 59, verse 10. Like the blind groping along the wall, 
feeling our way like men without eyes. At midday, we stumble as if we had no twilight. And despite our best efforts to overcome our tendency to rid ourselves of the impact and influence of sin, we are painfully aware that we can't. And we see evidence of it still in our society. And so we say we need help. We need a savior. But before we turn away and wallow in our despair, notice that there's good news in Isaiah's words too. He says in verse one, arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. you remember what the angel said to the shepherds in the fields surrounding Bethlehem that night. It says, today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And how encouraging that was to the shepherds to learn that the savior was born to you, to them. That the savior had come for them, for all humanity, every single man and woman, every boy and girl, Jesus has come for them. And in the same way, Isaiah now says, Your light has come. Your light has come to lighten the darkness, the darkness that we see all around us. Zechariah, he saw that as well as he prophesied. Remember, he couldn't speak. And then he said, his name is John. And then his mouth was open and he began to utter that word of praise and prophecy. And he says this in Luke chapter 1, verse 73. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare a way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Wasn't that amazing that he saw that through faith as the Holy Spirit uttered that word through him? Because of thy tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those who are living in darkness in the shadow of death, to guide our feet to the path of peace. Those who are living in darkness will see a light. They will see a great light. In fact, the King James Version says, until the day spring from on high has visited us, the light of the world who came to save us from our sin. As Jesus comes into our heart, when we open our hearts to him and say, into my heart, come into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And he comes into our hearts. His light comes into our lives and darkness must flee because his light dispels darkness. A lady's husband became a Christian A few months later, a neighbor asked, is it true that your husband has changed his religion? She said, no, but his religion sure changed him. See, he is Christ now. Haven't you noticed he doesn't come home drunk anymore? He doesn't swear anymore, and he takes time with the kids. He is a new man. Peter puts it this way, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now, this motif of light and darkness is used often in the Bible to contrast the difference between what God does in a life and what the devil does in a life. It's like the difference between walking in darkness and walking in light. Years ago, Barb and I were part of a tour group to Israel, and we went to Egypt first, and we were going to Mount Sinai. We were going to go up the mountain and experience sunrise as we did that on top of Mount Sinai. But what that meant was we had to set our alarms for about 2 in the morning and uh, get on the bus, and we would go to the base of Mount Sinai, and we would go up. Well, we had arranged to have uh, some camels, and so we'd get on our camel. If you've ever ridden a camel, it is an experience. 
uh, because its hind legs go up first and then its front legs, so you basically are like this. And I'm holding on, nothing but this little, little saddle, and I'm holding on for dear life, hoping I didn't fall out of this camel. It comes to, it stands up, and then all of a sudden, with the command of its Bedouin owner, it starts running in the dark. Now, the only light around us was this little light that was where we were getting on the camels. And so this camel's running into the darkness, and I mean desert darkness. You couldn't see anything but the stars above, and they were magnificent. And so here I am. I have no reins to stop this thing, and it is running full bore, and all I'm doing is praying, Lord, let there not be a cliff. Well, finally, it slowed down. And I realized that we had begun our trek up the mountain because I could feel, you know, the saddle going this way. And again, I didn't know where I was. I didn't know who I was with. I didn't know anything because it was pitch black. And then I heard a familiar voice, my wife's giggle. And I thought, okay, good. Uh, I'm, I'm here. And of course, we realized and we started checking in. Is that you? Is that you? Is that you? And we realized that we were all together. And my camel was just running to be with all the rest of them as we made the journey up. So much nicer when we can see than when we're blinded by darkness. But the beauty is that Jesus is saying that none of us needs to remain in darkness. For he says in John 16, verse 47, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. We don't have to live in darkness. No, we don't have to remain in darkness. We don't have to allow our lives to be destroyed by the darkness. No, we can allow God to come into our hearts and our lives and produce light. And when he does that, when he brings forgiveness of sins, when he brings the presence of the Holy Spirit, when he begins to transform our hearts and our lives, what do we do now with this light that is within us? Well, Isaiah says that we are to arise and we are to shine. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. But have you ever noticed how easy it is to allow the negativity of others, the negativity of the media, the negativity around us to impact our own hearts? And before long, it's easy to begin to complain just like everyone else. We complain about this and we complain about that and we complain about that other thing and we begin to look at the future with a pessimistic attitude. And it, when that happens, we might even start, stop looking for God to do great things among us. We might even stop asking God because we think it's no use. Where is God in all these things? But it's so important that we don't, that we look forward and we say, Lord, I believe. I believe that you are a great God. I believe you are a present God. And I know, I know that you're at work in my neighborhood. I know that you're at work at my classroom at university. I know that you're at work in our church, in my community. I know you're at work in the hearts of those in my family. It would have been easy for those to whom Isaiah wrote to shrink back in a spirit of despair. So he gives them another option. Shine. Let the love of Jesus, let the grace of Jesus let the power of Jesus be evident in your lives. Sometimes we think we need to create or manufacture this light within us as if we're the source of the light. But instead, we're called to reflect his light, a light that's already shining in our hearts. Well, how do we do that? Well, basically, we just throw open the curtains of our souls and let people see the good things that God is doing in our lives. What do we do at night? We shut our curtains, don't we? Is that what we do? We shut our curtains so that people walking on the streets can't see into our houses, can't see what we're doing? And he says, open up, open up the curtains. Let the light shine. Let people see what your life is like. Let people see the hope that you have. A hope that God can do the same thing in their heart, in their lives. You see, as those who know Jesus, he has granted us the ability to shine for him. And because of that, others can be impacted by his light. 
See, we have experienced the love of God, and that, hopefully, will help us to be people of love. We have experienced the grace of God, and hopefully then, as he transforms our hearts and our attitudes, that will help us to be people of grace. And we have experienced the purity of God, the righteousness of Christ in us, and hopefully that will produce in us and help us to be people of purity. That's why Jesus could say in the Sermon on the Mount, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your light then shine before men that they might see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. When Paul Henderson, who scored that winning goal of the Canada-Russia Summit Series back in 1972, well, when he became a Christian, it took him about three days to muster up the courage to tell his wife, Eleanor, what he had done. And when he did, she wasn't too happy. She wasn't happy with his decision, and she didn't want any part of Paul's newfound faith. Don't talk to me about that stuff. Don't leave your Bible out. I don't want to hear you playing any of that music on the, on the radio or on the record player. Just leave me out. However, she couldn't help but notice the difference that Jesus made in his life. And three months later, she too gave her heart to the Lord. Well, it didn't take long for the news to get out in the hockey world that Paul Henderson had become a Christian. Instead of trying to deny it, though, he said, Lord, would you just help me to shine your light? Would you shine your light through me? Well, near the end of his career, there was a guy who had driven Paul Henderson crazy over the years. His name was Bill Butters. He was a tough guy that took pleasure in ridiculing Henderson. So he would skate by the bench and Butters would cry out, watch out, he'll hit you with his Bible. And he would say it loud enough that the fans behind would hear and they would all laugh as well. Then one night, the two teams were playing each other. Butters motioned to Henderson to come and meet him at the center ice at the pregame warm-up. Oh, Paul dreaded this kind of confrontation. And he just thought, oh, do I need to go? But he was motioning, so he skated toward him. And as he got closer, Butters looked at him straight in the eye and said, Paul, do you have any information about that Christian stuff of yours? <laughs> Paul looked back and said, are you serious? Butters said, I've never been more serious in all my life. But what if Paul had hidden his light? What if he had acted and behaved as if he didn't know the Lord Jesus? What if he never acknowledged that he was now living for the Lord? What if? But he didn't. He allowed the light of Jesus to shine in his heart. And he opened up the curtains of his life. And he arose and he shone. That's what he did. And likewise, we can't be afraid to let the light of Jesus shine forth in our lives. William Barclay says, there can be no such thing as a secret disciple. For either the secrecy destroys the discipleship or the discipleship destroys the secrecy. Your heart, your language, your words, the, all those things, your attitude, your actions, they will betray you and show you for who you really are. And hopefully then what they show is that we are a life that has been touched by the heart of God. When the apostle Paul stood before King Agrippa and told the story of how Jesus met him on that Damascus road and commissioned him to shine. Paul puts it this way. Acts chapter 26, verse 17. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they might receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So we shine. 
We shine not just for ourselves, even though there's great benefit to us for allowing Jesus to do a work in our hearts and in our lives, but we shine also for others. We shine so others can know the goodness of God in their lives too. Back in the summer before I tore my Achilles tendon, I took Molly for a walk to the dog park and she was playing with some other dogs and I was standing, I was talking to the owner of the other dogs, it's just a lady, and as we talked for about five, 10 minutes, she looked at me and she said, are you a Christian? I said, yes. I could tell by the way you talked. And I thought, Lord, would you do that more often? Would you allow the light of Jesus to shine forth and do something as simple? We weren't even talking about the things of God. We were just chit-chatting. But would you allow your light to shine forth? Would you use my speech and my deeds and my attitudes to confirm that I belong to you? Would you help me to shine? And as we look at 2023 and we look forward to that, I would pray the same thing. Lord, use our speech. Lord, use our deeds. Lord, use our attitudes to confirm that we belong to you. Because you see, we have this world that's in darkness. And they need to know that there is a light. And his name is Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, we can be distracted at times. We can become focused on our problems or our own needs that we forget to look around us and see the needs of others. We become like Vladimir Nabkov, who was visiting a friend in Utah in 1940. Vladimir was a butterfly collector, and he spotted a butterfly he had never seen before. So he got his little hat on, and he got his little net, and he was running after this butterfly. As he was running, trying to catch the butterfly, the butterfly was doing a very good job of eluding him. As he came down near the gully, he heard a painful groan down in the, by the stream at Bear Gulch. But he was preoccupied with his butterfly, so he ignored the sound. The next day... An aged prospector was found dead by the stream, and the gulch was renamed Dead Man's Gulch. See, many don't know about Jesus. Many are unaware that he came to earth to be their savior, to rescue them from darkness. And so we need to shine, because when we shine, people take notice. One of my favorite Christmas memories as a kid, was going to my grandparents' farm. And of course, when all the uncles and aunts and everybody came, there was a lot of people in the house and so many people that the kids kind of got pushed outside, even though it was cold. But we didn't mind because we knew what we were going to do. We were going to play kick the can. And of course, that was a lot of fun for us. And, and uh, it was dark and it was snowy and, and we would allow those who were it to have a flashlight and, of course, they would try to shine and find out where we were. But it was kind of to our advantage because we knew where they were. Unless, of course, you had one of those jackets with a little bit of a reflector. Or you had a little reflector on your shoe. And all of a sudden, they're shining on the bush. And there, that reflector shines. Oh, Lord, would you allow the reflector of Jesus within us to shine forth so that others will notice? Well, others will notice the peace and the assurance that you bring, even in the face of a year that our prime minister says might be difficult and challenging. Peter says this, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, and we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you do well to pay attention to it. As a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises upon you. He's saying the same thing Isaiah was. Let the light of Jesus shine in your life. So as we stand at the beginning of a new year, let me ask you, are you walking? Are you living in the light? Or are you walking and living in darkness? Do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? 
Jesus came many years ago. We just celebrated Christmas to bring us light. John, who loved this imagery, he says this in John chapter 1, verse 4, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So this morning, as you're watching online or you're here in the audience, would you give Jesus permission to shine his light into your heart, to transform your life by his redeeming grace? Would you ask Jesus to come into your life? We can do that right now. That begins with a prayer. Maybe you want to pray with me. Dear Jesus, I thank you that you are the light of the world. I realize that this means that you represent all that is good and pure and true. I admit that I've made some messes in my life, and today I give you permission to shine your light upon them so that you can cleanse and forgive me. So I'm inviting you to be my Lord and my Savior. I want to follow you. I know that you're good because you died on the cross for me. I know that you're all-powerful because you rose again from the dead. So I ask you, would you transform my life? Would you help me to shine your light to those around me? I pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer, then God's light has begun to shine in your heart. Others will take notice. And as a result, Jesus will be glorified in your life. One man said, well, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to see God glorified in my life. So the pastor says, well, when you light a candle, when do you expect it to shine? It shines right away. Likewise, when Jesus, who is the light of the world, enters your heart, you will shine. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Let's bow our heads together. Lord, we're thankful for what you have done and what you can accomplish in our lives. We are so grateful, Lord Jesus, that you came to earth to be a light in the midst of darkness. Thank you. Thank you for coming into our hearts. Thank you for coming into our lives. Lord, thank you for working and, and cleaning up our messes and, and transforming us to be more like you. We pray in this new year that you would allow us to shine for you, I ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. I pulled out a very old song. I have, we hadn't sung it for many, many years.